Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we're uh, cracking open a slightly different kind of source. We've got excerpts from CCFA 200B exam practice questions and explanations. That's right. So instead of, you know, a typical manual or report, we're looking at what CrowdStrike thinks is important enough to actually test people on for their certification. Exactly. And our goal here is to pull out the core knowledge, the really practical stuff about the CrowdStrike Falcon platform's capabilities. All straight from the context of these CCFA 200B exam prep questions. Yeah, so you're not just getting dry exam facts. We're hoping you'll get insights into things like um, network containment, real-time response. Automated actions, custom detections, reporting, access control, all that good stuff. And it's all drawn directly from these questions and the provided explanations. It's kind of a unique angle, right? Seeing the platform through the details they think are essential for someone to prove they know it. Definitely. It should give us some practical insights. Let's jump in. Okay. So first, I'll maybe just quickly touch on the exam basics. The source gives us a few details. Sure. It mentions it's web-based, so online, and... Uh, Likely proctored. Okay. And it's one hour, 30 minutes duration? Yep. 90 minutes for about 60 questions. 60 questions, 90 minutes. Passing score is 70%. And delivered in English. Pretty standard stuff, but sets the scene. Right. Good to know the framework. So let's dig into what these questions tell us about Falcon itself. First up, um, host isolation. A big one. Yeah. Question one asks about the result of placing a host into network containment using the Falcon console. And the options, they varied quite a bit, didn't they? Like yeah. total network cutoff versus just some limits. Mm -hmm. But the source is very clear. The correct yeah. answer is A, the host can only communicate with the Falcon Cloud. Nothing else. Only the Falcon Cloud. That only seems really important. It is. The explanation hits on this. It limits interaction with other devices, other networks. You know, typical containment. Stops the bleeding, basically. Stops yeah. lateral movement. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But crucially, it keeps that connection back to the Falcon platform. Why do you think that specific channel remaining open is so vital? Well, because containment isn't the end game, right? You stopped it spreading, but you still need to investigate, maybe run scripts, pull files off it. Precisely. You need to manage the host, remediate it. And you do that through the Falcon agent, talking back to the cloud console. If you cut all network, you lose that remote control. You got it. You contain the threat outwards, but keep your management channel inwards. Containment with ongoing management capability. Makes perfect sense. Now, that's interesting when you compare it to question six. It talks about the quarantine action for detection events. Sounds similar. It sounds similar, but it's different. The source points out its primary function is distinct. Containment is about the host's network. Okay. Quarantine, according to the answer D, is about moving a malicious file to a secure location on that host. Ah, okay. So containment, host network isolation. Quarantine file neutralization. Pretty much. The explanation says quarantine isolates the file to stop it running or causing harm on that specific machine, but it keeps the file there, maybe for later analysis. Right. So related concepts, but different targets. One deals with network access, the other with a specific files activity. Exactly. One stops the machine talking to others. The other stops the bad code running on the machine. Different tools for different parts of the problem. Okay. That distinction is clear. Yeah. So once you've maybe contained or quarantined, how do you actively interact with the host? Question two asks about real-time response, or RTR. What's needed first? The source says prerequisite B is key. The host must be actively communicating with the Falcon Cloud. Actively communicating. Mm. So the sensor needs that live heartbeat back to base. Mm -hmm. The explanation says this is so commands can be delivered to the sensor and, crucially, responses can come back from it. Why is that real-time connection so important for RTR? Couldn't it, like, queue commands if the host was temporarily offline, what's the implication? Well, think about what RTR is for. It's like having a remote command prompt or shell directly on that endpoint. You're running commands, show me processes, delete this file, get this registry key, and you expect an immediate response. Ah, uh, right. It's interactive. Exactly. If the host isn't actively connected, that live interaction just isn't possible. Commands wouldn't go through instantly, responses wouldn't come back. It means if an endpoint drops offline, you lose that immediate RTR capability until it reconnects. So that active connection is fundamental to how RTR actually functions. Got it. It highlights how much of Falcon's real-time power depends on that sensor cloud link. Okay. And speaking of getting data from the platform, question seven mentions the Falcon APIs. What kind of information does the source say you can get? The answer B lists. Sensor version, host information, and detection events. Sensor version, host info, detections. 
Seems like the core data points you'd need. Absolutely. Think about automating things or integrating Falcon with other tools like a SIM or a SOFAR platform or just generating custom reports. Right. So what kind of workflows does having API access to just those three things enable? Why are they the key ones? Well, for a SOC, knowing the health of your endpoints is crucial. Mm -hmm. Is the sensor version up to date what OS is running? That's host info and sensor version. And then obviously you need the alerts, the detection events to feed into your security monitoring systems. So you could, say, automatically create a ticket in your ticketing system when a critical detection happens. Exactly. Or enrich alerts in your SIME with detailed host information pulled from Falcon via the API. Or even trigger an automated response, like isolating a host if a certain type of detection occurs. Okay, so it provides that essential data feed for integrating Falcon into the bigger security picture. Precisely. It's the operational data stream. Makes sense. Let's switch gears to how Falcon stops things automatically. Question three asks what the Falcon sensor does when it spots a known malicious file. The source gives answer A. The file is blocked and quarantined automatically. Blocked and quarantined automatically. Yeah. So no messing around if it's known bad. Seems like it. The explanation confirms it's an immediate action, stops it executing, stops it spreading. That feels like basic table stakes for endpoint protection these days, doesn't it? Just automatically shutting down the known threats. Absolutely. That's the preventative power. Mm. The sensor acts instantly based on the threat intel it has. It's not waiting for a human to click a button. It's that automated front line. But what about stuff that isn't, you know, a known piece of malware, but maybe looks dodgy? Suspicious behavior. Question four gets into custom IOA's indicators of attack. Right. It asks when you'd use a custom IOA in Falcon. And the answer? Answer C. To detect and prevent specific behaviors unique to your environment. Unique to your environment. That implies the standard built-in detections might not cover every specific trick an attacker might try against you personally. Exactly. The explanation says custom IOAs let you tailor detection to your organization's specific threat landscape. Can you give an example? What's a specific behavior unique to your environment that isn't just like running malware.exe. Okay, think about um, maybe PowerShell. PowerShell itself isn't malicious, right? Your IT team uses it all the time. Right. But maybe attackers in your industry are known to use PowerShell in a very specific way. Perhaps downloading a script from a particular external source, running it with specific obfuscated commands, and then trying to access credential stores. Okay. A standard detection might just see PowerShell running. A custom IOA lets you build a rule saying, if PowerShell runs and it connects to this type of external address and you uses these kinds of suspicious command parameters and is launched by this type of user account, then block it and alert. Ah, so you're stringing together several conditions that individually might be okay, but together spell trouble for you. Precisely. It lets you codify your own specific threat intelligence based on how you operate and what you're worried about tailored detection. Okay, that makes sense for tuning. And speaking of tuning, question 10 asks about a setting in prevention policies, the one that decides if suspicious activity gets blocked outright or just logged. Yeah, the source points to answer D, the machine learning slider. The ML slider, yeah, I've heard of that. The explanation says adjusting it balances mm -hmm. uh, detection sensitivity against false positives. Can you unpack yeah. that trade-off? Sure. If you slide it higher, towards more prevention. More aggressive. Right, more aggressive. Falcon's machine learning models become more sensitive. They'll block more potentially suspicious stuff, mm. benefit. You might catch more zero days or novel threats early. Downside. Risk of more false positives. You might accidentally block legitimate software or admin activity that just looks a bit unusual. That can cause operational friction, you know, help desk calls. Okay. And if you slide it lower. Less aggressive. You'll likely get fewer false positives, which is good for operations. But the trade-off is you might let more sophisticated or borderline threats run for a bit longer. You'll probably get an alert or a log entry instead of an instant block. Requiring a human analyst to investigate. Exactly. It shifts the balance from automated prevention towards detection and response. It's that classic security tension, block more aggressively versus minimize disruption. That slider represents a really key operational decision then. Okay, so we've got detections, preventions. How do you see all this happening? Question five asks about a dashboard component for real-time threat insights. The source says answer A, the threat graph. Threat graph. The explanation mentions it gives real-time visual insights, shows relationships, timelines. Why is the graph format important? Why not just a list of alerts? 
because attacks are rarely just one single event, right? They're usually a sequence of actions. A process starts another process, which writes a file, which makes a network connection. A chain reaction. Exactly. A simple list of alerts might show you each step, but kind of disconnected. The threat graph visually links them together. It shows you the whole story, patient zero, how it spread, what processes were involved, what files were touched, maybe across multiple machines. So it helps you understand the scope and the narrative of the attack much faster. Definitely. You see the connections, the progression. It turns a pile of logs into an understandable incident picture. It's about seeing the story. Makes it much more actionable. Okay, thinking about the endpoints themselves, the sensors. Question 9 asks, what happens if one stops checking in with a Falcon Cloud for a while? According to answer B, it enters reduced functionality mode. Reduced functionality mode. What does that actually mean in practice? The explanation says some capabilities get limited. Yeah. Does it stop working entirely? Not entirely. Usually it means it's lost that constant connection to the cloud brain, let's say. So it might lose access to the very latest threat intelligence updates or the real-time cloud-based machine learning analysis. So it relies more on what it already knows, what's cached locally. Yeah, it might fall back to more basic signature detection or previously known policies. And things like real-time response obviously won't work if it's not connected. Right, we covered that. So it still provides some level of protection, but it's degraded. It's basically the sensor raising a flag saying, hey, I'm not fully connected or managed right now, something's wrong. It alerts the security team that this endpoint needs attention. Okay, so it becomes a management issue as well as a potential slight security gap. Exactly. It's a host health status indicator. Got it. One last area the question's touched on. Access control within the Falcon console itself. Question 8 asks about the best role for someone whose only job is reviewing detections. The source suggests answer A, the event viewer role. Event viewer. Seems pretty self-explanatory. The explanation confirms it's for viewing detections without permissions to change policies or configurations. Why is that important? Why have a role that's purely read-only for events? It boils down to the principle of least privilege and separation of duties. Okay. You only want to give people the minimum permissions they need to do their job. Someone who just needs to look at alerts shouldn't have the power to, say, accidentally disable prevention policies for the entire organization. Right, that would be bad. Or delete sensor data or change user roles. The event viewer role limits their potential impact purely to observation. It reduces the risk of accidental misconfiguration and also limits what an attacker could do if that user's account were ever compromised. Makes total sense. Limit the blast radius, even for your own users. Considering these specific functions like the nuance of host containment letting it only talk to the cloud, or needing that live connection for RTR, or the trade-offs in how aggressively you prevent things, what parts of endpoint security management seem most critical for keeping both control and visibility in today's really fast-moving threat landscape? And maybe, how can these seemingly small operational details, the kind you find in an exam question, have really significant consequences when you're actually dealing with a live security incident? Something to mull over.